is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen indeed. Uh, Melissa, thank you. And thank you, Jesus, for teaching us to pray. Um, I know we don't generally look at these things in our branch of the faith, but I want to show you something from the Greek Orthodox tradition. That is the uh, Greek Orthodox icon of John the Baptist. And I first saw that at the home of my Greek Orthodox son-in-law, who is John, um, who is named after his grandfather, who is named after his grandfather, after his grandfather, his grandfather, because that's kind of how Greeks roll, right, with the names of their uh, firstborn sons. And, uh, but ultimately, all these Johns get their name from this guy, from John the Baptist. Actually, my son-in-law's icon, is, it looks a little different. It's even more grisly than that. It's, it's, um, it's John holding his head, but he doesn't have a head on his neck. Ooh. That's because one of the things John is famous for is losing his head. <laughs> and you can read about how that happened in the Bible. Um, but let me ask you this. What, what else do you know about him? What, just call some things you know about John the Baptist. What do you know? What do you know about him? What's that? He what? Eight locusts, yes. Mm, eight locusts. Yeah, that's a pretty memorable thing. What else? What else do you know about him? What do you, what do you know about John the Baptist? He's Jesus' cousin? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot about him that we see. There's actually a lot of ink on John the Baptist in the New Testament. We see here's just some different things about him. Um, yes, yeah, some, some that you mentioned there, related Jesus' cousin. Um, had that austere lifestyle, including eating locusts and wild honey. Honey, not so bad, but the locusts, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and some of the things that, uh, that, that John's gospel says of him that I find especially, especially striking. Um, it, oh, and also, by the way, we know because he did most of his ministry in the um, Judea area, which is, is south in Israel, that he was a Southern Baptist. <laughs> right? He was a Southern Baptist. We know that. Yes, he was. Okay, moving right along. <laughs> John's whole ministry, though, what he was all about um, was preparing the way for people to encounter Jesus, right? And that's really important. In fact, that's the most important thing that any church can be about, that through everything else that we're doing, we're trying to help people encounter Jesus. I mean, yeah, we want you to go to the Super Bowl party and have a good time and play dodgeball and, and all that stuff. We want you to have a good time when you're here in worship. We, we really want you to, to learn the Bible. But in and through all this stuff that we're about as a church, that the most important thing is we're, we're trying to facilitate encounters between people and Jesus, and, and why would that be? Well, that's because we, we really do believe like John, that Jesus is the one through whom God has come uh, to, to rule as king. Um, that Jesus is the one who models, who teaches, who embodies what it means to live in a realm where God is king, where his ways really do rule. And probably one of those well-known things that John said when he called people to, to recognize Jesus or kind of prepare the way for people to encounter him is he said this. He said, repent, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, when you hear that word repent, um, my guess is you probably think of, okay, repentance is turning from sin, right? Well, yeah, you're right. It is. Repentance involves turning from sin. But it's, it's a lot more than that, too. It involves a whole lot more than that. Um, Greek, Greek word is metanoia, which uh, was the theme of a conference some of us actually uh, went to last week. And, and, and what it actually involves, it involves a wholesale change. It's not just turning from sin, but it's, it's a change in how we think, how we feel, how we look at God, how we look at, at life in this world. And my guess is that if you've been, been a follower of Jesus for a while, that it probably doesn't feel like, like a big change to you. But, but think about it. If, 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 you're really, if, if what you're really going to be doing is embracing Jesus as your king and seeking to live by his ways, that means a whole lot of things that don't come naturally, at least not at first. It means looking at God, not just some you know, vague theoretical concept or is the one who you know, got the whole universe started at the beginning way back when. It means looking at who God is through the lens of this particular person, Jesus. It means things like forgiving people who hurt you. It means things like being kind to people who aren't kind back. You know? It means really believing that you are incredibly loved and valued, not because of your strengths, not because of your achievements, 
but because of what God and this person of Jesus has done for you. It means turning from the notion that the only real kings that you ever have to be concerned about are are kings like Herod, who can do stuff like make you pay taxes and throw you in jail and have your head cut off like he did with John, right? And again, all this requires a a, a metanoia, a repentance, a change from the ways we're naturally going to be looking at God and and trying to do life. And and the passage I really want to look at with you today is one where we see that John himself kind of needs to repent. He needs to, to, to kind of readjust the expectations he had for the kind of Messiah that, uh, that Jesus is. And maybe we need to adjust some of our expectations too. Anyway, here is the passage. It's Matthew chapter 11, starting at verse 2. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect somebody else? Jesus replied, You go back and report to John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. The good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about him. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who prepare your way before you. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. If you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Well, John... um, John is, uh, is presented to us that passage in Matthew, and, and Matthew is the gospel that's by far the most Jewish. Uh, Matthew has, has a ton of, of quotes and, and allusions to, to the Old Testament, more so uh, than, than the other, other gospels, and that's because Matthew was really concerned to present Jesus to Jewish people who were seeped in the Old Testament and the Old Testament's expectation of, of the Messiah who was to come. And, um, and John is a Jew. He's, he's from a priestly family. Uh, he's the one who is uh, uniquely called to be pointing people uh, to the Messiah. And when he first saw Jesus, he knew he was the one. Look at, uh, look at what he, he first says about Jesus and then what he, he says to him. He says, I baptize you for, with water for repentance, but after me comes one more powerful than I, not worthy to carry his sandals. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then to Jesus, he says, I need to be baptized by you and you come to me. And then right after this, he does baptize Jesus, and he gets to see the the Holy Spirit lighting on Jesus like a dove. He hears the voice from heaven saying, you're my son, you know? And then we have this wonderful, incredible statement that he makes in in John's gospel, Um, not John the Baptist, but John the gospel writer, talking, quoting John the Baptist, who says, look, he's pointing to Jesus, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So, so John here, he's declaring, and, and again, remind, this is before the cross, before the resurrection, before he's seen Jesus doing any miracles. He's looking at Jesus and he's saying, you know, not only is this the Messiah King that we're expecting, this is the Son of God. This is the Lamb of God, the sacrifice of God for the sins of the world. Wow! <laughs> I mean, there's anybody on the planet at this time who gets it about who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. It's John, right? And yet... <laughs> And yet the passage that we we just read uh, from Matthew's gospel, (laughs) he's not so sure anymore. He's got doubts. He wonders if maybe he'd gotten it wrong about Jesus. Maybe you've been there at some point. 
Maybe it's where some of you are right now. You, um, it's not, not outright unbelief, but, but doubts. Doubts about, about things of, of God, things of Jesus that you once believed a lot more firmly. And, and maybe like John, it has you wondering, you know, has it been worth it? Is it worth it to be a Christian? Is it worth it to try to follow Jesus? Where do these kind of doubts come from? Yeah. Well, certainly for John, you know, prison didn't help, right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, when you're in prison, not only is it, it pretty unpleasant living conditions, but you're also isolated. You're cut off from the outside world, you know? Um, and, and so, you know, there's, there's that. And, and also, you know, besides being in prison, uh, John, he, he also, you know, he had just been, been doing his prophetic ministry, which involved, you know, confronting people all the time and really ticking people off. And, and my guess is, is that, plus being in prison, had him just feeling really emotionally drained, you know? And when you're in a place like that, when you're in really dire circumstances and you're emotionally drained, that's a great, great recipe for questioning and doubting God and yourself and, and people you think love you, you know? But, but beyond even his, his circumstances and underneath his circumstances, John is having doubts here because Jesus is not living up to being the kind of Messiah that he was was expecting. John had been prophesying a Messiah who was going to judge. He was going to bring judgment. And the Old Testament said that's what the Messiah was going to, to do, what he was going to be about. And, and, and John looks at Jesus. He says, well, well, sure, Jesus is doing a lot of really neat things. He, he seems to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. But, but where's the judgment? Especially, where's the judgment on people like Herod? You know, Herod, who, who himself thought he was the king of the Jews, but who was this morally despicable guy, and who right at the time has John in his prison, you know? I mean, come on, Jesus, if you're the Messiah, you're supposed to be the one who's supposed to, you know, make everything right and bring about justice and, you know, punish evil and deliver your people. Well, how about starting by, uh, by zapping Herod and setting John free, right? But that's not what's happening, it's not what's happening. And so, and so John is, 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 is wondering, you know, was I, you know, was I wrong? Maybe I got it wrong about this guy. You know, why was I pinning all my hopes, all of Israel's hopes on, on him, on Jesus? And there's a, a story about a rabbi in New York City who had a, a Christian friend visiting with him in his apartment. And the Christian said to him, he said, Rabbi, Jesus is the Messiah that your scriptures point to. And the rabbi, as he's listening to his friend, he's looking out his window, he's looking at the streets below, and he's, he's thinking about how, how violent and how corrupt his neighborhood is and, and has long been ever since he lived there. And he turned to his friend, he shook his head, he said, no. When Messiah comes, there will be justice. Yeah. I think it is really important that we notice here what Jesus doesn't do. Um, he doesn't condemn John, he doesn't scold John for daring to doubt and to question, and he won't do that with you or with me either, friends. He won't. And we might miss it in Jesus' response because he doesn't quote directly from the Old Testament, but John would not have missed the very clear allusions to what, what Isaiah had prophesied about the Messiah. Again, remember Jesus' response to John, what he said for John's disciples to tell him, and then look at these lines from Isaiah. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like the deer, the mute tongue shout for joy, water gushing forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Then in 26, but your dead will live, their bodies will rise. Remember he said, said tell John that the dead are raised. And especially this one, which is cited in a number of, of scriptures in the New Testament. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners, people like John the Baptist, right? Now, it's interesting with all of those quotes from Isaiah, if you read on, he does go on to speak about judgment. He does. Uh, the, the very thing that John thought was missing uh, from from Jesus. And later in his ministry, Jesus would also speak about judgment. Um, he would speak about God judging. He'd speak about a future new creation where justice was going to prevail. Um, so, so why, when he's speaking to John, does he, does he leave that part out? <laughs> yeah. Because, friends, I think it wasn't time. 
It wasn't time. For Jesus then, and I would submit for the most part for us today as well, the time is a time to be teaching, to be proclaiming the good news that, that God's kingdom is here, that Jesus is the king. It's a time to be as, as Jesus was about, healing sick, proclaiming good news and caring for poor people, right? God's judgment is going to come when Jesus returns, and sometimes we need to remind ourselves of that. We do. But I really do believe, friends, that for the most part, these are the days of grace. These are times that while we're waiting for Jesus and judgment to be about the job of proclaiming him as Savior, him as King, Jesus as good news. Well, there's some interesting stuff in what he says uh, to the crowd about John. When he talks about that reed swayed by the wind, the man in fine clothes, some of the commentators think these are indirect references to Herod, who has him in prison, because uh, Herod apparently had coins made uh, that had a reed on it, and then the fine clothes, you know, from a king's palace, a little more, more obvious reference. And so Jesus' point would be something like this. Hey, when you went out to see John, were you looking for somebody like that? You're looking for you know, one of those, those you know, no good leaders like you know all too well? <laughs> no, you weren't looking for that, were you? You were looking for somebody with real godly authority, not the authority that came from Rome or, or from some privileged position, but authority from God, you know? And that's what John was about. Right? He was a prophet. He was more than a prophet. He was the prophet who would claim and announce that the Messiah had arrived. And then you have this wonderful takeaway statement about John's greatness and also the greatness that's available to people like us. Right? Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there's arisen none greater than John the Baptist. Yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. John's greatness is a greatness of the kind that that I think a lot of people, especially younger people, especially millennials and Gen Z folks, really, really long for. And I'm talking about greatness in terms of, of really making a positive difference in the world. You know, John, if he were uh, walking today, he wouldn't be John the Baptist. We'd call him John the Influencer. <laughs> You know, even if he didn't have a social media platform, he'd be John the Influencer. Because you know, what did John do? He was bold. He was calling people to change their lives and, and change their lives because Jesus is coming. He's going to change the world. And, and we can all be part of this revolution of his, you know? And again, I think a lot of people, especially younger people, that's what they long for is to, to be used to make a difference, you know? And that's a wonderful aspiration. It really is. But did you notice what Jesus says here? He says that John, yeah, John was a great guy. He was great, but but whoever's least in the kingdom of heaven. If you're living in the kingdom of heaven, he says, which means you recognize Jesus is your king. You're living under his governance. You have a greatness that goes beyond a, a great influencer like John. Now, that's not to say that, that you and I are going to have the breadth of influence that somebody like John does. But friend, if you are truly seeking to walk in the ways of Jesus' kingdom, you are having a great influence on people around you. And if you doubt that, let me put it like this. I, 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 the thing, if I were to ask everybody in this room, write down on a piece of paper the names of one or two people who have had the greatest positive influence on your life. How many people are going to say, oh, Elon Musk, <laughs> you know? Taylor Swift, <laughs> Joe Rogan, biggest podcast in the world, you know? Nobody's going to put those names down, are they? A lot of you would say, my mom, you know? Or you'd talk about some classmate or some teammate who, who probably weren't, you know, the, the smartest person in the class or the best player in the team, but they treated you really well. And maybe somebody that you work with or somebody you go to church with, but probably not the boss and not the preacher, Right? But somebody who you, you worked alongside who was just a really, really good and, and godly person, you know? And so as we kind of wind this down and consider just what are some takeaways, what do we do with all this? I mean, one thing would, would be what I've just been talking about, and that is, you know, if you are, are seeking to follow Jesus today, be encouraged, <laughs> be encouraged to know that the king says that you're great, Right? And great, not just because you're a son, you're a daughter of the king, which is pretty good in itself, right? But great because in seeking to follow Jesus, you're going to have a great influence 
on people around you. I think, though, that the, the takeaway probably most germane uh, to a passage like we've been looking at is more about what do we do with our doubts, with our disappointments. You know, when, when God, when Jesus turns out to be not the kind of king, not the kind of Messiah that we were, were expecting and, and maybe hoping for, you know, it doesn't put a stop to the wars going on in the world today. When he allows Herod, when he allows the tyrants in your life to keep treating you unfairly and seemingly to get away with it. When the cancer doesn't go into remission, when that that strong temptation that you've been begging God to take away from you for years is still there and just as strong as ever. Those are the times that maybe you want to just throw up your hands and like John say, God, Jesus, are, are you the Savior, really? Are you my Savior? Or should I look for somebody else? When that's where you are, I want to really, really encourage you, friend. First of all, like John, take your doubts, take your disappointments very directly to the one that you're disappointed in and that you're doubting. If you just try to bury your doubts and disappointments, you try to just ignore them, they only grow stronger. And also, God, he's not like that friend or that insecure lover who, who, uh, you know, who anytime you express doubt and disappointment, they just get mad at you, you know? He's not like that. And so you really can come to him with this kind of stuff. You can. And, and the way that you and I can, like John, listen for Jesus to respond to us is by looking at the Gospels, looking at what he says, looking at what he does, and, and hearing and seeing the kind of Savior that he really is. And then to ask yourself this, ask yourself is this indeed good? And is it enough? Is it good? Is it enough that he offers to forgive you now? Is it good? Is it enough that he shows a way of living in his kingdom that is congruent with the way you've been made to live with joy and purpose in your life now? Is it good? Is it enough that even if we don't see it now, that he's promised that there will come a day when justice supremely will be realized, and when everything is wrong with the world, everything is wrong with us, it's going to be made right. You know, I, I have to admit, when I first read this passage and I was, was thinking about Jesus' response to John, I, I kind of pictured his tone being like a, like a drill sergeant or a football coach saying, you go, go tell John to, to buck up and see what's really going on here. But the more I've lived with this, the more, I, I, I think it was different than that. I, I bet you it broke Jesus' heart to have to give John that reply. Kind of like, like the way, as a parent, when, when your child asks you for something that's actually really good, but you have to say, no, not now. You know, I've been there as a dad. Um, with God, though, of course, I, I'm not the parent. I'm the child. I'm the subject of the kingdom of which Jesus is king. But here's what I really am discovering, friends. I'm discovering that that even despite doubts and disappointments, that when I am really intently looking for and listening to and following the ways of this king, Jesus, I'm discovering that, that even in the midst of doubts and disappointments, they really are good and enough. Well, let's, um, let's pray. Grace, we've got a moment. We're going to say the creed, and as we do, we'll acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, that he's our Savior, and that's true. But often, oh God, um, he turns out not to be the kind of Savior that, that we want and even expect. And, and Lord, in those moments of realization, we ask that you would give us the wisdom and the willingness to listen to and to look to see the kind of Savior you really are and to see indeed that that is good and that is enough. And we ask it all in Jesus' name and for his glory to be manifest in and through even us. Amen. Well, our affirmation of faith today